privilege to have him here with us and to give the floor to him. Thank you so much. If you uh, thank you. Thank you. As I say, I'm very pleased to be in such a great company. And thank you, of course, to the foundation for inviting me to come here. And I'm very pleased to be here. Yesterday, I had the, the, the speech of the last of, uh, prosecutor of the Nuremberg trials, and as well as the representative from Brazil. It has been a wonderful initiative to have the public prosecutor of the Nuremberg trials as the keynote speaker uh, in the opening um, of this conference. And then because we, uh, well, the basis of the universal jurisdiction is found in Nuremberg trials. He said something yesterday in his paper, which was very important, and I uh, would like to qualify it a bit. So he said that the idea of prosecution in Nuremberg was an agreement reached between the Roosevelt uh, pre uh, president, be Churchill from UK, and the Secretary General of the uh, uh, Communist Party in Russia, Stalin. Uh, so and I would like to clarify something in here, to qualify something. Well, the initiative came from Roosevelt. He, he was the driving force. He wanted he, uh, to have the trial for the crimes that were committed under the Third Reich during the Second World War. Because the original position of the first, uh, well, the Prime Minister of the UK and the Soviet leader was just a classic one. OK, the classic one against the wall and shooting and killing, and then problem solved. However, the Roosevelt team had the insights and they said, no, they have a right to be defended. And then the world should know through legal proceedings what they did. And then for the first time, a president was set in history to prosecute the unnamed crime. As Churchill was mentioned, at that time did not have a name, was not named as a genocide. So genocide has always been there in, in, the, in our history. But for the first time, a name uh, is given to it, and it is prosecuted. And since 1946, when the uh, Nuremberg trials the uh, uh, issued conviction. Then we had to wait for years before another trial did another court did the same. And then, well, we could go and say what happens with the what is the use of the laws of from the um, Nuremberg trials? Why is justice is not applied, etc.? Why we have to wait for so many many years before this is done again? Well, here we are talking about criminal, international criminal law, extremely severe crimes that are committed through states and through the resources of the state. Therefore, in order to apply those laws, we require yeah, well, very specific requirements. First of all, we really need to have a force or a power which is able to contrapose, to offset, or to oppose the, the state. And this is not a simple thing. So therefore, if we need thousands of years to have the Nuremberg trials, and then the effective execution of universal jurisdiction arising from the Nuremberg trial laws. And if you still can see that this is still starting to walk, well, we can say that we are following the right path, you know, because we are opening up new paths. What, important, what is important here is the process, the speed, efficacy, rapidity. All that depends on many factors, factors which are changing factors, starting off by the actual laws, as one of Shakespeare's characters says. Well, one law is removed by another law, so there is nothing permanent, there is nothing final or forever. So actually, the case that I was so lucky to start falls within this framework. And as Ferenc's uh, public prosecutor said, mentioned yesterday, that the problem in this kind of crimes and prosecutors is the following. That is to say, the requirement of three factors. First of all, existence of laws. Uh, 
recognizing those crimes. They exist since 1945, ratified by the countries that we are discussing today. We've been discussing yesterday as well. Second, we need to have a court, a court to take, uh, to apply this law or where where victims can recur to. And third, we need to have the, the an enforcement, the law enforcement. For in the case of Chile, same as in the case of Spain, well, the Republican institutions were destroyed. Then the laws were uh, effective. However, the application had been suspended, has been halted. Well, so anyway, well, the laws were there, but were not enforced. And then, on the basis of that, they found the search, and they found in Spain a court that was really uh, ready to listen to them. That was in 1996. The victims arrived in Spain. So Spain did not go to Chile, but the Chileans came to Spain. And here we are talking about individual victims. Then an investi investigation was initiated uh, for one and a half years. Evidence was collected. And then it is also very important to mention the political factor. As it has been said here before, there is a significant cultural parallel between the Spanish Republicans and the uh, Francoist repression and the situation in Chile and in other Latin American countries. So therefore, the start of prosecution of Pinochet in Spain is seen and interpreted in, by the Spanish society with national parameters both on the part of the victims of Francoism and those also on the part of those who relate to the perpetrators. So there was a strong mobilization against those who were uh, re that related with the Francoism uh, regime and repression. And that conflict or that uh, uh, is still there, that clash is still there. And the same happens in Chile and in the rest of the world. The military resurrection in 1973 finished, terminated with a constitutional system where liberties, uh, freedoms were effective. And that was the interpretation made by the whole world. So therefore, when the process was taking place in Spain, we had the need as well as the luck to have a vast international understanding for us to continue with our process. And as the prosecutor from Nuremberg just said, it is important to understand that we are not here. This is not a clash between nations and between states. There is like a horizontal uh, situation or context where people, no matter what they are in the world, understand uh, that a crime is a crime, no matter the color of the flag under which it was committed. And then, well, we also have other people that justify the commission of that crime on the grounds of uh, political and religious uh, uh, reasons. And then, well, the situation is there, and sometimes there are triggers that uh, kind of activate that latent state or latent situation that is always there. And this was the case of Pinochet. Therefore, it was thanks to the coalition, coalition that triggers this activation that we, well, that uh, ended or resulted in the prosecution of Pinochet. And we, when, when it was also achieved that their supporters in Chile, the supporters of Pinochet in Chile, found or received international isolation. Well, a few days later after the arrest of Pinochet, they asked me and they said, 
Well, can you see that this would endanger the transition to democracy in Chile? And well, my response has been published. And I say, well, I know very well why a military coup took place in 1973. And because I have the key reasons for that, I can tell you, I would anticipate that today there would not be a military coup and Chileans would move into democracy. And transition to democracy in Chile starts right now. And actually, yesterday, as we heard from the legal experts from Brazil, it was very important as he was sharing with us the Brazilian experience that could be extrapolated to the Chilean case. Courts were closed. However, transition to democracy in none of the three countries that I am discussing, well, as the Brazilian speaker says, would not be possible if it is not clear that insurrection against the uh, dictator regime is incompatible with the law and order. And as long as this is not clear, because the transition to democracy it was subject to what he referred to as controlled transition. In Chile, the process in Spain well, was the result of a strong internal will to terminate with the impunity. So therefore, the snowball effect of the legal process moves on, continues to move on, has never stopped. At this point in time in Chile, there is a very strong response, a deep response that is starts from here, from a legal process. Well, actually, 15 days ago, a judge from Santiago brought charges against the unofficial of the Air Force that bombarded the Mint in 40 years ago, in September 73. He brought charges. He's prosecuting him on grounds of crime against humanity. So it is just a continuation, a development from the Pinochet case. But at the same time, we have the other coalition. That is to say, the coalition that committed the crimes, that protected the crimes, that accepted them, and that is looking for impunity. But that, and that coalition is very, very powerful, much, much powerful and superior to the first one. And actually, it has been dominating for decades now resulted, um, well, we've seen the domination through all the killings that they have been making over all this time. And then it is, at this point in time, where a proceeding such as the one that I'm sharing with you today can take place. Well, because from the legal viewpoint, here we are having, well, if we're reducing it to uh, legal terms, here we have a facing of, well, two different worlds. So we have two clear references, the Nuremberg trials and then the norms. Well, please let me know about the time. OK, before let me, when we, my time is over, let me know three minutes in advance. Now, and then the Kantian, Kant's vision. He is the best at embracing the principles of the French Revolution. Actually, he coined the term cosmopolitan law. Well, we have the law of the state, but then there is another one, another law, which is the humanity law, human values that are different from those of the states. And of course, that needs to be uh, defended. Well, this is a philosophy principle that uh, took years before they were typified into crimes against humanity, as we know them today. But there is another legal idea or conception. Well, to give you a reference, I should mention the leader of the National Socialist Association of Legal Experts during the Third Reich a great legal expert, Carrie Smith, that he said that sovereignty is not in the hands of the peoples. Well, these are kind of 
he said that sovereign, sovereignty resides in it having the capacity to declare a state of exception. And declaring a state of exception means being above the law. So, war state, I declare war. So, and please do not tell me about the law, no matter whether they exist or not. It makes no difference to me. So, the state of exception as international policy or state of emergency is what has been issued after the September 11th terrorist attacks in New York, where uh, we had a coalition of states that said, I have sovereign power, and I'd like to declare, I'm declaring a universal state of emergency. And from that moment onwards, well, it happened with laws, what everyone has seen afterwards where universal jurisdiction became an enemy to be fought against, to be fought against, because they, uh, it was based on, uh, well, they used to preserve the fundamental and um, basic of human rights. So this is the fact that we are seeing in Spain the legal situation that was created two months ago. Well, it has been created. I'm sure it will change over time. It will change in a, in a few months. As undoubtedly, it will be changed. It will be modified. That is to say that local exception, that local situation of the state of emergency. We could also see that at the end of the Cold War, but at the late 90s. So the Cold War is over. The laws are surfaced. Courts start to take action. But since 2010, the contrary happens, the opposite happens. And then when you found disciples of Harry uh, Smith here in Spain, where he has lots of supporters amongst the Franco's supporters. So Smith's followers are there, out there. And they uh, have, they are in, they are highly influencing people. Many of the legal decisions that have been made in Spain in the past uh, few months, uh, one of them being the amendment of universal jurisdiction, is has been made by some of his followers. So, therefore, the question is. Um, what is the alternative to the effectiveness of the international laws that are applicable? Well, the danger of imposing in practice the conception of the law, which is a threat that was militarily uh, brought down in, in 1945, but, uh, which, but today has a different name. Well, there is a clear interaction between the internal or domestic law, which is fundamented on the or based on the international law, but which has uh, which is enforced domestically. Well, the law is not something abstract; uh, it is born and then changes and then dies. Well, in the Spanish case, it is essential to understand that the dictatorship that came to power uh, in 1936, and as the troops moved forward with the support of the German and Italian um, military. So the regime lasted up until the person who had the power to declare a state of emergency died. But if it lasted for so long, it was due to international as well as to domestic factors. Regarding the international factors, here we have the coalition that supported it, that financed it, and that consolidated it as of 
1945 through a coalition different from the first one. And to my mind, in my opinion, the great difference versus what happened in Latin America and in Brazil, as it was mentioned here yesterday, is that in the Spanish case, the coalition that supported the dictatorship and that later consolidated it up until 75. That coalition of states was not interested in opening up the an investigation about what happened in Spain between 1936 up until today in terms of massive crimes. Well, changing regimes, etc. but where we can clearly identify, identify the states behind it. So now I understand why the ETHR is not open to admitting any causes or any cases related to crimes committed in Spain during this time period. Contrary to what happens with the Latin American Court of Human Rights, has been repeatedly condemning or denouncing Brazil, Chile, etc. Therefore, so therefore there is an internal fight. Well, the internal fight has found a shelter has found the protection of the support from the Latin American Court for Human Rights. Well, it was evident regarding the Pinochet coup, uh, case that there was going to be a reaction, a strong reaction that had been formed, those that had been formed around the state of emergency. Well, this would not have been possible if those who could do it did not anticipate deactivating the possibility to bring down or to anticipate what these forces, these strong forces were going to do in Chile, that is to say, to hinder or to limit the proceedings that were taking place both in Spain and in Chile. In Spain, the sectors that I mentioned before, the informal casual coalition that relates to Franco's regime and impunity, the first day that the case was brought to the tribunals, they started to make every single possible effort to terminate, to close the investigation. As Eduardo Frey mentioned at that time, president of Chile, he said, well, this is a paradox. You have an absolute impunity regarding crimes committed within Spain. Now you want to prosecute the crimes of a lesser volume, so to speak, or of a lower volume and size that have been committed in Chile. Well, that paradox was not admitted by the sectors in Spain that were very much uh, willing to close the investigation. When they had enough support at the parliament, they have decided to harmonize international law and domestic law in Spain and to bring it to the lowest level, abs level absolute immunity in Spain, so no competence for Spanish law judges to apply or to enforce international law that makes it mandatory to prosecute those crimes. And the judge in Spain that dared to open the doors of his court and to listen to the victims of that period of time in history, then at that time, then problems, the problems started. And then they make an example of him for the others. So this was the case in Chile as well. How during the dictatorship, there was one judge, Juan Carlos Cerda, that in the 80s, he decided to investigate the chief commander of the Air Force. And then the Supreme Court suspended him 
for a few months and he was about to be expelled from the exercise of his profession. But later on, he was promoted by the High Court. Now he is at the High Court, but he reached the High Court from or driven by the social pressure, the social pressure. And the veto was lifted, and then when he was promoted, he reached the Supreme Court. Well, this is not the case in Spain. We have not arrived there yet. Uh, the Spanish uh, peoples are there. And contrary to what happened with other genocides in history, well, there have been three large genocides in the modern history of Spain. In 1492, expulsion or expelled, Jews were expelled. 1609, Muslims were expelled. And then the Great Repression, as of 36, more than half a million Spaniards were expelled from the country or forced to, to leave the country. Well, the first two genocide actions, well, the third generations are living in Spain, their sons and their grandchildren. So therefore, it is a question of time that that situation of impunity has been is.